All right, good morning, everyone. Hopefully you all can hear me okay. Um, Happy New Year. Thank you for being here so early the day right after New Year's. Um, For those of you who have not had the privilege to meet yet, uh, my name is Sophia Fang, and I'm the first Pediatric Ophthalmology Fellow here at Moran. And today I have the opportunity to share with you some hopefully interesting perspectives on strabismus, more than meets the eye. So every time I walk over the bridge on the fourth floor of Moran over to our pediatric ophthalmology clinic in primaries, I pass by this sign. This little cartoon boy says, sometimes I feel like a really hard math problem the doctors are trying to solve instead of a person. (laughs) And admittedly, this is not my favorite sign. However, it does serve to remind us that in our brief 10, maybe 15 minute encounter with our patients in our fairly contrived environment of a clinic exam, we're often inundated with all of the measurements we have to make and the boxes we have to click, that we often only get the opportunity, that we often only get the opportunity to understand our patients in the rather narrow confines of these labels. And we don't always get the opportunity to fully appreciate how strabismus impacts their day-to-day life. So for the next few minutes, let's take a little pause and a step back from the medical jargon to understand a little different perspective of strabismus. According to the top-selling American English Dictionary, the Merriam-Webster, strabismus is defined as the inability of one eye to attain binocular vision with the other because of imbalance of the muscles of the eyeball, more commonly known as ocular misalignment. The word strabismus is considered to be late 17th century modern Latin, and as I've been told, uh, Dr. Mamelis ensures all the residents know, uh, comes from the Greek word strabismos, which means to squint. Strabismus, I think, is quite unique amongst eye diseases in that it's a condition that is often readily apparent to people walking around on the street. In other words, it's visible to the naked eye. And as such, strabismus has a long history that not only predates modern medicine, but also carries with it a deeply rooted stigma in society. So let's take a little trip back in time to see where it all began. The earliest documented mentions of strabismus come to us from ancient Egypt around 1550 BC in what is known as the Ebers Papyrus. The Ebers Papyrus is a document that is currently housed um, at the library at the University of Leipzig in Eastern Germany and is considered to be the most extensive and best preserved record of ancient Egyptian medicine. In it, strabismus is described as a distortion of the eyes. One of the earliest unequivocal depictions of strabismus also comes to us from Egypt around the 13th century BC, which is the end of their 18th dynasty. And it is a depiction of Isotropia on a well-preserved painted sarcophagus lid of Lady Isis, uh, who was the spouse of a famed artist of the time, Quebecant. Some of the earliest theories regarding the etiology for strabismus are that it results from a cramp of the muscles that occurs after staring at an oil lamp or another object with one eye for a prolonged period of time, or that it's essentially a curse that's invoked by evil humors and spirits. And so you can imagine that some of the earliest treatments for strabismus were various purges and potions coupled with incantations and attempts to rid the evil spirit uh, from the body. The Ebers Papyrus, for example, contains a page of various treatments for eye diseases, including a remedy consisting of equal parts turtle brains and spices used to treat strabismus. It was unclear from the translations whether this was something that was applied topically or ingested orally. Uh, In the 600s AD, there was a Greek physician known as Paul of Aegina who developed these metallic masks to help patients straighten out their eyes. This one is for convergent strabismus, and this one is for divergent strabismus. The same physician, Paul of Aegina, also developed another treatment for esotropia that involved purple or red flocks of wool that were fastened to the lateral canthi or to the temples in order to attract the attention of the interning or esotropic eye to help straighten them. And so certainly, we've come a long ways over the centuries in our scientific and medical understanding of strabismus and how to treat it. But what about the psychosocial stigma? In the mid-19th century, one of the major figures in American ophthalmology was Dr. Alfred Post. After setting up his comprehensive surgical practice in New York City, he published a popular book in 1841 called Observations on the Cure of Strabismus. 
in this brief 67-page book, he basically uh, discussed the state of the art of the medical and surgical treatment of strabismus at the time. And on page 13, he said, the most striking effect of strabismus is the deformity which it occasions, frequently subjecting the patient during childhood to ridicule and insult, and being throughout life a source of mortification and mental disquietude. Since this time, there have been literally thousands of studies done to provide evidence that this observation is true, that strabismus does in fact impart significant um, psychosocial impact on patients who suffer from it. And although we certainly don't have time to discuss all of these studies, I would like to share a few of the ones that I think help illustrate some important ideas. The first idea is that implicit bias towards strabismus is acquired and develops early in life. First, let us define what implicit bias is. Implicit bias is an important concept in the world of social psychology. According to the Kirwan Institute at Ohio State, implicit bias refers to the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. These biases, which encompass both favorable and unfavorable assessments, are activated involuntarily and without an individual's awareness or intentional control. In 2001, Dr. Pacey and colleagues at Baylor and Texas Children's set out to determine the age at which children start to perceive strabismus, AKA develop implicit bias in dolls and to evaluate their reactions. To do this, they recruited 34 children between the ages of three and seven who were essentially patients of their pediatric ophthalmology clinic or siblings of those patients. And so 47% of them had a diagnosis of strabismus themselves and individually placed these children in a waiting room with a one-way mirror. In this room, there were only three toys with which the children could play, which were essentially three versions of the same doll. So this is the original unmodified orthotropic doll that was then modified to create <coughs> exotropia and esotropia. The reason why they chose this particular doll, which some of you may find looks familiar, this is an action figure of Goku, who's from Dragon Ball Z, it was because this group had done a previous pilot study where they showed uh, various types of dolls to children and found that this was the only doll with which boys and girls equally interacted. This is why they chose this doll. They would observe the children in this room for 10 minutes and then directly ask them about their preferences and attitudes about the dolls. For the observed play portion, they had predefined what they would consider to be positive and negative behaviors. Positive behaviors were things like cradling, caressing, kissing, or verbally complimenting a doll. Negative behaviors were things like throwing, striking, or verbally disparaging a doll. For the expressed response portion, they asked the, the subjects, what was the first thing you noticed about the action figures? What was your favorite action figure, or did you like them all equally? Why was that figure your favorite? Was there an action figure you didn't like or did you like them all equally? Why didn't you like that figure? And what did you think of the action figure's eyes? The results, of course, were quite interesting. They showed that there is a progression of bias that seems to develop in children, that the youngest children did not even notice the strabismus, the slightly older children between the ages of four and a half and five and three quarters years old noticed the strabismus but didn't have a clear preference, and that the older children who are five and three quarters years old and older were 4.4 times more likely to display negative reactions to the strabismic dolls and 73 times more likely to report a dislike of the strabismic dolls. And the results were not affected by the gender of the subject or whether or not they themselves had strabismus. So the takeaways from the study are that negative attitudes towards ocular deviations are acquired responses which appear to emerge around age five and that corrective surgery for strabismus at an early age may help to reduce the psychosocial stigma experienced by these children. The second idea is that even the best among us in one of the most influential roles of early childhood harbor implicit bias. In 2003, a group in Turkey set out to determine whether the presence of noticeable strabismus among children created negative social bias amongst elementary school teachers. To do this, they took headshot photos of four normal orthotropic children. This is, for example, is one of the children. They had two boys and two girls, and essentially photoshopped them to create obvious 45 prism diopters of esotropia and exotropia. They then showed these photos to 30 elementary school teachers, 
in separate sessions so that in each session the teacher would only see one alignment state per child. And without knowing the purpose of the study, the teachers were asked to rate their perception of each child on a scale of one to five on 10 personal characteristics the authors felt were important for social functioning and functioning in an educational environment. These were intelligence, health, trustworthiness, capacity for hard work, happiness, cuteness, hesitancy, aggressiveness, activeness, and sentimentality. They, an they then asked the teachers to answer yes, no, or maybe to five questions. Would you assign the student to a duty during cultural activities at school? Would you take special precautions to prevent the student from cheating during a test? Can the student be accepted into a social group of friends? Would the student have any difficulty in learning? And can the student fulfill the responsibilities given to him or her? For the results, when it came to the 10 personal characteristics, there was a statistically significant difference in the ratings with orthotropic children being rated higher than the strabismic children in terms of their perceived health, capacity for hard work, and happiness. The exotropic children also were rated higher than the isotropic children in terms of their capacity for hard work and happiness. When it came to the five questions, there was also a statistically significant difference amongst the children in the teacher's perception that it was harder for strabismic children to be accepted into a social group of friends and that isotropic children would have more difficulty learning. The takeaways from this study are that even the best among us, elementary school teachers, are not immune to having negative implicit bias against children with strabismus. And that this can obviously inadvertently affect the way teachers treat children with strabismus in some of their more formative years of development. The third idea is that even in older kids and adults, strabismus is not just about cosmesis. Of course, we're all familiar with the visual consequences of strabismus, but even when you are no longer able to chase after stereoacuity or improved vision in younger children, there are real and serious physical and psychosocial consequences of strabismus as well. Dr. Pinellas and colleagues at UCLA, for example, showed that elderly patients with strabismus had higher odds of sustaining falls and musculoskeletal injuries. And in addition to dealing with a problematic self-image, self-esteem, and confidence, Patients also suffer from other psychosocial consequences, such as uh, being ridiculed and bullied at school or at work, having difficulty with eye contact, being perceived as insincere or less trustworthy, and having decreased prospects for employment, especially among women, which can obviously affect their livelihood. In 1993, Satterfield and colleagues at UC Davis set out to assess the psychosocial implications of growing up with and living with socially noticeable strabismus. To do this, they identified 77 subjects, age 15 and older, who had uncorrected or incompletely corrected childhood strabismus past the age of 13. They mailed them two things. One was a questionnaire they created with 25 items that asked about past medical history, ocular strabismus history, as well as asked them to rate the impact of strabismus on various aspects of their life during childhood, teenage years, and adulthood. They also sent them the Hopkins symptom checklist that had 58 items on it. This is a widely used standardized symptom inventory to identify psychological distress and therefore has um, a large normative database to which they can compare. They were able to get responses from 43 subjects, or a little bit more than half, and uh, they reported that strabismus had a negative impact on many aspects of their lives, difficulty with self-image, securing employment, interpersonal relationships, school, work, and sports. They reported that these problems intensified rather than abated during the teenage and adult years. And the Hopkins symptom checklist showed that they had generalized higher levels of distress compared to their age and gender matched counterparts. The takeaways from this study are that psychosocial difficulties with socially noticeable strabismus are not just a problem for school children, but perhaps even more so for teenagers and adults. Correcting strabismus is more than just about cosmesis, but rather carries the potential to help improve psychosocial functioning and quality of life. And the last idea is that strabismus surgery works, not only to improve vision and stereopsis in children, but also in restoring a more normal appearance and to improve psychosocial functioning and quality of life for both the young and the young at heart. And these are just a sample of the studies that have proven this. 
And so in conclusion, I hope that I've been able to intrigue you with some interesting perspectives on strabismus and how it impacts the lives of our patients and the wonderful opportunity we have to help them. Any questions? So you bring up a very important point, and there's no question that uh, I can remember uh, you don't see as many young kids today anymore, you know, who are older. We have done a much better job of getting these corrected at an earlier age, but uh, that was not the case back when I was a kid, and I can remember there were a fair number of uh, uh, friends who had fairly large amounts of deviation, both XO and ESO, and I remember that, that how horribly they Treated. I mean, I, I even even I remember as a kid seeing how they were taunted and called wall-eyed, and, and you can imagine the impact that you know that that would have on people. And then it, it's interesting, but I, I watched how we were doing a much better job as you move into the '60s in correcting this. And then I, I went to Sweden, and they weren't for some reason. And I saw a lot of people, um, and and you could you could watch how self-conscious they were about that, how they didn't want to look straight at people, how they'd look to the side, because if you look straight is when it was obvious, mm -hmm. or I, I, you'd watch uh, uh, girls who'd comb their hair down over one eye trying to cover it. And um, I, I, there, there, it, it's, we often forget about that particular aspect as we're dealing with this, of, of what a huge impact that would have on self-image and self. Um, just not only, are they being negatively perceived? But they, people themselves are, pre, uh, you know, are perceived as that there's an issue or problem because people obviously stare at them and think there's something wrong or abnormal. So I think it's a great issue to bring up. Hi. I'll share two kind of anecdotal experiences. But my, my most grateful patients, for sure, are not often the ones who regain stereopsis by surgery, but typically the ones who regain, you know, what appears to be. Orthotrophy. Right. I mean, that they, they look straight. They they are the ones that are typically in tears and say this is really life changing for them. Um, and I remember seeing a patient in fellowship who was a woman in her 40s or 50s who um, came to us and she said, "I heard this can't be fixed," mm -hmm. which I think is still a pretty common um, common feeling in the in the community um, and is conveyed to patients by uh, a number of ophthalmologists even. But um, we. My mentor told her, oh, no, no, we can, we can certainly straighten your eyes. And she just looked at us with this pause. She says, you mean I, I could have had this fixed before? And she stopped and sobbed for several minutes before we were even able to move on. But she just thought about how much How much pain, she'd gone through. Yes, yeah. and how, how, much, how, just how destructive this had been to her social life and to so, many, so much of her confidence and her, and her self-image. And it was really interesting. I mean, she just, just broke down. Not that she, I mean, and, 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 uh, not because she was, not, not at all because she was excited to get it fixed, but because she was so sad that this had been, she had been told for so long that she couldn't get it fixed, and she had gone so long with this, and it was, it was, it was just a very sobering image. Yeah, we've got to get beyond this concept that this is a cosmetic mm -hmm. surgery. Cosmetic insinuates this is a vanity thing. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is way beyond that. This isn't worrying about a couple of, you know, a smile wrinkles that have happened. This is this is clearly a, well, the, a the major argument, social impact. The, the argument that I think insurances have bought into and now pay for it is that you know cosmetic is defined as something that um, t typically, and I could be wrong, but as we as I understand, cosmetic is something that you want to make look better, but it's not inherently abnormal as it is now. Or it, I mean, it could be abnormal, but it's a part of the normal aging process. Where this is, would be more rehabilitative or restorative. Mm -hmm. Because it's abnormal, and you just try to get it to normal. <laughs> Maybe my, I don't know if oculoplastics feels like that was an unfair characterization of cosmetic surgery. <laughs> anyway, excellent job. Oh.